Hi and welcome to the second lecture of the transmission electron microscope. Uh, as you can see, we, the, today's lecture will be conducted in the lab here with the microscope. And uh, the topic of today is electron diffraction. And I already prepared two samples that I put in the sample holder that we're going to study. One of the samples is the molybdenum trioxide, and that is an orthorhombic crystal structure material. And what that means is that it looks sort of a simple cubic in structure, like a cube, but the, the, the length distances of the cube side is uh, different. So it is not a, a straight cube. Uh, in order to know the, the lattice spacing of the crystal when we're studying it, we need to calibrate the system. And usually you do that by putting in a known sample that you know the lattice spacing of. And today that sample will be aluminum. So I also have the second sample here, it's a sputtered aluminum sample. By, by checking that we can calibrate the system and, we, and I can also demonstrate the effect of if you have, for example, polycrystalline materials. How does the electron and electron diffraction look in that case? That I can demonstrate also with this. So let's start by putting the sample. As you can see now, I put you to view the camera image of the microscope. I think it's easy because it's dark in the room now. And the thing that you see now, that, that is the, the, the TM grid with the spotted aluminum on top of. So uh, the, the bright areas here, that is uh, a thin, thin layer of aluminum that's been coated. You can magnify this and, uh, and look at just one of these uh, transparent squares. So this is how the spotted aluminum sample looks like in the bright field imaging mode of the transmission electron microscope. You can see that the, it looks like the whole surface is co covered by small grains. And that is correct. When you spot the aluminum you get a surface that looks like this. So what we have here is the multiple amounts of small aluminum crystals that are oriented in, the, in completely random directions. And uh, we're going to do electron diffraction on this sample now. And uh, I asked you to switch over and then I discussed the image. So this is electron diffraction mode. Like so. Here we can see the electron diffraction of the spotted aluminum. You can see it, the pattern is uh, several concentric rings. And these rings are created because we have this tremendous amount of crystals that we're making the diffraction pattern out of. And uh, if you stack all this pattern on top of each other in random directions, they will just create these rings. The idea here is to use this as a calibration sample to calibrate the, the length distances in the, in the image. Because we know the lattice spacing of aluminum. So by measuring the diameters of these circles, we can calculate a proportional factor that we then later can use when we're going to measure our real sample, the molybdenum trioxide. As I said, this was a, a, the diffraction pattern of the, the whole region that is illuminated by the electron beam. You can select a smaller region instead, and that, then we use the selected area aperture. So let's try that. I go back to the bright field image now. So this is the bright field image again. Now I put in the selected area aperture. Like so. You see it is a small disk that selects out a region of the sample. And this region we will take the electron diffraction pattern from now on. So here you see the electron pa diffraction pattern again. Because we have selected a smaller region, less crystal will contribute to the pattern. And that will mean that the circles will be less apparent in the pattern. We can try an even smaller aperture to, to increase this effect. So now, you see, I try the smallest aperture. This, uh, this diameter of this disk is much, much smaller than the last one. And that will mean we get the very few crystals now. You can almost count them in the, in the image there. So let's see how the pattern looks, uh, looks from this one. Then. You see, uh, the circles are almost uh, barely visible now because it's so few crystals that contributes. So we start to approach more and more towards a single crystal electron diffraction pattern now. I think this demonstrates the effects of this polycrystalline and, and single crystalline uh, diffraction patterns. If the sample instead would have been amorphous, then we wouldn't have seen any dots at all, just a blurred 
region in the center of the image. So that's how you can determine if it is a morphous sample or if it is a crystalline sample. All right, let's switch to the molybdenum trioxide crystal and see a depth pattern. That will be from a single crystal, and then we can see that it will have this uh, orthorhombic pattern. So it, it will basically look uh, cubic. All right, now we're back from the lab and we've done all the measurements on the electron diffraction. So we have a diffraction pattern from this aluminum, this calibration sample, and the molybdenum trioxide. You remember I said that we're going to measure the distance and the diameter of the rings in the sputtered aluminum pattern. And uh, we're going to measure the four inner rings of this pattern. And uh, if you measure the horizontal diameter of the rings, then you will get for the inner ring 220 pixels. And if you measure in the vertical direction, you get 221 pixels. So that's it's sort of the same. But uh, uh, as you can see, for example, the second inner ring has uh, 253 pixels versus 259 pixels, horizontal versus vertical diameter. And this is caused due to astigmatism of the system. Uh, of course, the circles should be completely round. And what we know, this aluminum sample, we know the lattice spacing. We know the, 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 that the, the width of the unit cell will be 4.049 angstrom. So then we can take advantage of that and, and use that to calibrate the system. And there is a simple rule that goes in this relation. And we can write that as a as a constant k that's equal the s parameter times the d parameter and the s parameter that is the 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 length that you measure on screen in pixels uh, of course there is, there is also a third factor involved here and that is the wavelength of the of the beam that you shine on, onto the sample but because we use the same accelerating voltage in both the calibration sample and in our molybdenum trioxide sample then we don't need to take that into account the d parameter here that is the corresponding lattice spacing that uh, corresponds to this pixel size that we measure in so that means that we, if we know what kind of lattice plane that's causing uh, th these uh, rings, then we can calculate uh, the, the, D, the D value because we know the A parameter from the aluminum because it's a known specimen. And that means that we can calibrate uh, the system and calculate this, this K constant. So for example, for the inner ring in the aluminum, we get that K equals and we take the average between the vertical and horizontal diameters and that is 220.5 pixels times the this uh, d spacing that we calculated and the d spacing for this uh, inner ring that's the 111 plane that will be 2 2.338 angstrom and then if you calculate all this then it will give us a k factor of 515.5 pixel angstrom in units. So what we do with it is then we, we do the same calculation for all, all four inner rings of this pattern and then we take the average, the k, the k factor will be the average of all those. And uh, as you can see here I get the average of 517.2 pixel angstrom. So now let's look at the molybdenum trioxide pattern. You know that it looks like a squared shape pattern. And because it is orthorhombic, that means that the, uh, the cube lengths in, in this uh, orthogonal uh, crystal will be of different lengths. So we don't have one A parameter. We will have, have one A B, A, B and C parameters that all are different. And for molybdenum trioxide, the A and B value is sort of the same. It is the C value that is have a, have a greater length. Uh, the C value is around, I think, 13 uh, angstrom or something, but the A and B is around 3.7 and uh, 3.9 angstrom total. So then we measure two, two orthogonal directions in our di diffraction pattern of the molybdenum trioxide. And I take these two just to simplify it. I measure those to be 129 pixels for A length. And I also measure 136 pixels for the B length. 
So now when we're going to calculate the lattice space, and we use our constant that we had from before, that was 517.2 pixel angstroms. And then we divide that with the pixel length that we measured in the screen here. So then we get uh, 129 pixels for the A value. And, uh, and this will give us a, a value of 4.0 angstrom. And this is from the 100 plane, so that means that the, the, this will be the, the lattice parameter they write off, right? Because we, otherwise we would need to multiply with the square root of the Miller indices, you know. But because it's 1, so it will be multiplied by 1 in this case. So that means that the, the A value here is 4.0 angstroms. And we do the same thing for the B value, and the B value gives... Uh, 517.2 pixel angstrom divided by 136 pixels and that will give us 3.8 angstrom so basically what we know now is that we have this this cube of the lattice and we know two two dimensions now the a and the b the the bottom of the cube that is and we know that this one is 4 now, and this one is 3.8. Now we don't know the c-value, the length, the height of this uh, cube, this unit cell. And uh, that will remain unknown for us. In order to, to measure that, we need to tilt the crystal. What I want you to do now is a complex problem that uh, is sort of is the end of this chapter of the course. And... Uh, uh, this this one is a, a little bit fun problem, I think. It's a completely different topic compared to electron diffraction, but but you know that in the TEM, right, you have very thin samples. The samples can be sort of down to a 50 nanometer in thickness, that is sort of standard. Let's say that you have a sample that's 50 nanometer in thickness. And then you shoot electrons on top of this. Uh, let, you can say you have 200 kilovolt uh, accelerated uh, electrons so they have 200 kV that uh, of energy that goes into the sample you know that the the electrons interact with each other when it passes through the sample and so on because of all these things that you can read in the book what i want you to to do now is to calculate how many electrons that comes from the beam beam that exists at the same time in the sample. I mean, it, it, you can see the beam as a discrete array of particles that tra transport through the samples, right? Uh, so what I want you to do, to do now is to, to calculate how many of these electrons are at the same time inside the beam. You know the speed of the electrons due to the kinetic energy because of the accelerating voltage. So then you can know the, know the speed. You know the the beam current. You can say that the beam current is uh, oh, what shall we say? Uh, we can say that it is uh, five microampere, five microampere beam current. So then you know how many electrons that travels also. So how many electrons will be in this same volume of the sample? And because it's a very thin sample, I don't think you can expect so many. But I think you will also be surprised of what the result will be that you, that you will find out after you've done this calculation. So do that complex problem and then you post the results of your calculation as the procedures given below. See you on the next chapter.